value from success, growth, and discovery. Golden Arrow Resources is a well-funded gold copper exploration company with proven management and prospective properties in Chile, Argentina, and Paraguay. Golden Arrow trades on the Toronto Venture Exchange, symbol GRG, on Frankfurt, symbol G6A, and the OTCQB, symbol GARWF. For more information, visit us at goldenarrowresources.com or call Sean at 778-686-0135. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is retired but still issue engaged television reporter Harvey Oberfeld. His blog is keepingitreal.ca online at harveyoberfeld.ca. Welcome back to the show, Harvey, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good to talk to you. Let's hope this is a better year than 2020. Harvey, in your recent Keeping It Real blog, you spoke on the concerns of the government and media becoming one, or at least too close for comfort of the people. Can you tell us about the blog post? Well, this is something I've, you know, I've blogged before about, I'm a little concerned about the uh, softness of the questioning of politicians we see these days. And the pandemic has made it worse, because under the pandemic, of course, everything is done by remote pretty well, and uh, you have to get recognized to ask a question. And, for example, a couple of days ago, I was watching the the presser with uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry and uh, 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 Adrian Dix. And, you know, Henry spoke for 30 minutes. Dix spoke for about 10. And then they had four time for four people asking questions. Four people. And, uh, of course, it's the government official who gets to us uh, to... Uh, to decide who will ask questions. Uh, that's very dangerous. I, I don't like, I mean, a guy like me would never get recognized probably because I'd be too, uh, you know, asked, I used to ask tough questions. And, uh, so they ask these questions that clearly I think have been prepared before the, uh, Dix or Henry had even spoken. So the questions are pre prepared and they're not really listening to what Dix is saying. So they don't challenge her. They don't challenge uh, him or anything like that and that really bothers me because the best thing you can have with a politician is a conversation you ask your question but then you listen to the answer and if you don't get the answer you want you shoot back you're not answering the question or you know but that's not right what you just said you know something like that and in, uh, in the current format what they do is they ask their question and then they're asked do you have a follow-up you're allowed one follow-up and they usually have another pre-prepared question, so they ask that, and I think we're suffering for that. I think uh, it, it really is government control uh, of the media, very subtly done, uh, but it is sort of controlled. And, and there's no better evidence than that. If you listen to the reports, I have heard so many cases now where reporters, and this is on radio or TV, right, because the print is a little different, but on radio or TV, I've heard so many reporters referring to what the government is doing or how BC is handling the pandemic or what measures are being taken by BC. And they say, we. What do you mean, we? I've never, you know, the government is not we. The government is they. Uh, and when a reporter or, uh, or a bunch of them start referring to the government as we, this is what we're doing, the collective we, I don't think that's very good. I think it shows that uh, they're too soft on them. They're they're almost becoming part of the team. And listen very carefully. I urge people when they're listening to reporters talking about the B.C. government now, it almost sounds to me like they sound like government spokespersons, almost like government bureaucrats telling us this is the message from on high and this is what we're telling you folks. Where, you know, I mean, it is the job of the media to tell you what the government is saying and what the government is doing, what the policies are, what the actions are. But another very important part is for the media to tell the government, this is what the people say, this is what the people want, this is what the people think you're doing wrong, and we're not getting very much of that these days. We're just getting sort of, this is the message from on high to the people, and the government... The, the media are not 
challenging the politicians enough. And and, and I'll, I'll say something. When you have watched them, let's say, at town hall meetings, listen to them on radio, listen to their press conferences and to their briefings, have you ever noticed these days how the politicians don't get any, they certainly don't get angry, the bureaucrats don't get angry, because the questioning is so soft that they, their feet are not being held to the fire. I, I suppose uh, be under the desk, they're where they've come to wearing sandals because their feet are so cool because they're not having any heat applied to their feet by the media today. And it's sure changed a lot from the good old days when reporters were more aggressive, when reporters were less chummy with the politicians, and when reporters realized it's our job to almost be as much a part of the opposition as the opposition is because, you know, it's our job to challenge. Well, Brian Mulrooney might have been the start of it because he his favorite thing was to say, how dare you ask that question? How dare you? Well, I, I used to have, I enjoyed trying to ask Mulrooney questions. Uh, when I was in Ottawa, uh, I, I quickly observed how it worked. You know, Mulrooney would walk by, and the, you know, if it wasn't an official press conference, and reporters would shout questions at him. And if he wanted to stop, if it was an issue he was prepped for, if it was something he wanted to talk uh, talk about, or especially if they were from Toronto or Montreal, uh, they, he would stop and chat. And there's uh, Harvey uh, calling out something about something going on in B.C. on the waterfront, on the developments, on anything, environment, anything we were trying to get funding for, and he would just keep walking by. And he wouldn't even listen, he wouldn't even hear me, you know. So I started to realize, well, this isn't, uh, this isn't working. Uh, so what I started to do is I started to ask a question as he would walk by, instead of saying, what are you going to do, are you gonna, you know, about the waterfront project, you know, or something like that. I'd say, Mr. Prime Minister, have you got a moment for Western Canada? And he would keep walking, and I would go, oh, I guess not. And then people would tune in TV because I would use it. I would use that on the air. And people would tune in and they'd see him talking to Quebec reporters and Ontario reporters. And then he walks by us and I say, have you got a moment for Western Canada? Or better, have you got a moment for British Columbia, sir? And he would walk right by. And then I'd say, oh, not today. Uh, and, you know, that really hurt him. I mean, I heard that from some... Uh, conservative MPs, they, they, they confided in me that this was damaging him, and they confided it in, to him, too, I heard, in the caucus. And, uh, you know, Mulroney was, well, what do you want me to do? You know, I, you know, because they knew what I was going to ask usually, because you phone ahead and say, I need to get something from the PM on this and that, you know. And uh, so he'd keep doing it. So uh, I actually have right here where I'm sitting in my den, I have a picture of me with a microphone that Mulroney's photographer took, me trying to ask Mulroney a question and Mulroney wrote on the on the picture, Harvey, I like you better without the mic. So, you know, um, uh, I mean, he knew what was going on. I knew what was going on. But then he started to stop and answer questions. I, I did the same thing with Jean Chrétien. Uh, Jean Chrétien used to, you know, I'd, he'd walk right by and ignore me. And uh, I uh, one day, uh, and the RCMP would come and stand almost right in front of me, facing me, uh, as he would walk along, knowing that I might, you know, shout something. And uh, I shouted something. I said, Prime Minister, you've got a moment and, uh, for B.C. And he stopped. Of course, I always have time for British Columbia. And, uh, and, and what I did was I said to the RCMP, would you please move aside? The Prime Minister and I are trying to talk. And they, <laughs> they weren't amused, but I think he was. Um, but that's what you do. That's how you get your question in, and that's how you get aggressive. Um, and, and I used to take on, I, I took on the press gallery when I first went to Ottawa. I was so naive. Uh, I went to a prime ministerial press conference, uh, one of my first ones, and I went in early so I could get on the list to ask a question. I think I was the first one there. So I put my name on the list, you know, and uh, then the, the guy from the press gallery in charge of the press conference, usually an executive member, everybody else started to arrive and all that. And when it came time to ask questions, uh, all these other people who had arrived quite later than I had got recognized. 
well, they were from Toronto media, they were from Montreal media, national media as they called it, and here's uh, Harvey from BC TV, you know, out there in the boonies, uh, and I couldn't get a question in. So then as he was getting up, you know, one last question, I said uh, something about, what about, Prime Minister, do you, uh, what about a question for British Columbia? And he looked at me, I don't think he even knew who I was at that time, I was so new, uh, and uh, he said, sure, and I gave him a question, he gave me an answer, I don't even remember what the topic was, but shortly after that I got a letter from the executive of the gallery threatening to lift my card because I had shouted out in, uh, out of order, you know, and they were going to lift my card. And I went and said to them, said to the executive, because they were trying to reprimand me, you go ahead and lift my card for trying to ask a question. Lift the British Columbia reporter's card for trying to ask a question. You'll make me a hero out, in the, out uh, back home. And uh, they never did lift my card. But after that, you know, you'd be amazed how often I got to ask questions. So you can be aggressive without being rude. Uh, but nobody's aggressive anymore. They just sort of, you know, give me a clip, give me any kind of clip, and I'll go away happy, and you'll go away happy. Uh, but I think BC is suffering for that. I think the media has gone soft uh, at pretty well all levels. The print is a little better, but the radio, the TV, the town halls, the pundits are far too soft on the politicians. Uh, especially uh, in uh, Victoria. Are there great reporters out there being stopped from investigating news stories by higher-ups in the organizations they work for? Well, I don't think they're deliberately stopping them. I don't think there's a plot in, you know, like, let's go easy on this particular government or that. What's happened is, especially with the takeovers and each each takeover, the company usually has paid more for the station than the previous one did. So they want to recoup their costs. So what do you do to recoup your costs? You cut the number of people working. You cut the functions. You cut the budget if you can. Or not cut it, but you don't increase it uh, substantially. You then start to try to hire, as happened, I think, in the media here. Uh, you hire cheaper reporters. Uh, you know, the great success of BCTV was that they hired away senior newspaper reporters from the Vancouver Sun, from the Vancouver province, they hired experienced journalists and were willing to pay for it and also then taught them how to do TV. Now you can get two or three kids or young reporters for what you pay for a senior reporter at, uh, at a newspaper or something like that, a, an established reporter. So they, uh, they, they don't want to spend that, so they hire away kids or people, young journalists, uh, who also don't know much about politics, don't know much about political history, don't know much about history, in fact. Um, and uh, But they work, uh, they, they cost less, uh, they probably can be pushed around more than some old fart who's going to put his, uh, you know, demand uh, uh, respect, you know, and that sort of thing. So that's happening. The second thing that's happening, because TV or radio stations are trying to do so much more there's so many more broadcasts. There's early shows. There's online presence. There's noon shows. There's uh, late shows. Everything, you know, uh, they push the reporters to do more and more and more. So in that kind of context, I don't believe there's very much time for anybody to do any investigative work. You've just, it's you know, it's like you've got to produce stuff day in and day out. So it's not so much... Uh, the reporter's own fault, a lot of it, I believe, is a management problem. It's a management problem by trying to do more with less, sometimes a lot less, and then the people running the desks, from what I've seen, also don't have, are not seasoned old grizzled reporters or journalists or, uh, uh, you know, seasoned uh, uh, investigative types. Uh, and so they don't even know uh, how to uh, do investigative stuff, or they don't care, or they're maybe even intimidated by the reporters that they're under their their uh, jurisdiction because the reporters are older than they are. So it's a whole combination of things. And uh, now with the media here being run so much more from back east, you know, Frank Griffith's dream of a Western-based uh, network, you know, right here in British Columbia at BC TV, uh, it's run from back east. CTV has news bosses back east uh, and corporate bosses who call the shots. 
CBC has news bosses back east, so there's no real uh, uh, top control being exercised here. There's there's some regional control, but I just don't think that we're getting the type of local uh, presence or local authority in running it, and I don't think there's the quality running these desks that we used to have uh, running the uh, the show. And, and and when you just think of some of the people, think of think of Clem Chapel, think of Russ Froze, think of John Gibbs, think of John Daly when he was reporting, think of Harvey Oberfeld, think of uh, Rafe Mayer, think of Jack Webster, think of all those people that we used to, Gary Bannerman, all those people who used to push and push and push. Now they're just so happy to get the minister or the cabinet minister, anybody on as a guest, that the questioning has gone very, very soft. And uh, and I can see it, and it, it even though I'm retired, it bothers me, and that's why I decided to write about it on the blog, and uh, and a lot of people are agreeing with me, which is almost sad in a way, but unfortunately, uh, the blog is called Keeping It Real, and I think that's what I've done in this case. Mainstream media ownership in Canada can basically be counted on one hand. Is this concentration of ownership good for the people of Canada? I don't think so, but I, I think it's part of the reality because of costs, uh, you know, independent ownership. I mean, it's, it's, you know, amalgamation is the name of the name, big corporate things. I, I think the problem is more that the people at the top don't see it as much as a calling. It's a more of a business, right? It's a, it's a, it's just like owning a string of motels. Uh, each one is supposed to make money or cut the costs or shut it down or, how many of them that they shut down? It's all just seen as a business. But, you know, it's hard to believe now, but there was a time, uh, at the time of Bruce Hutchison at the Vancouver Sun, at the time of Frank Griffiths, who set up BCTV, and Ray Peters. Uh, there was a time when people that owned the Siftons in Saskatchewan, there was a time when people who owned these entities took great pride in what they owned and the role that the media played in the society. And now I think it's just a holding company. I mean, you know, it could be uh, the same companies that hold TV stations or radio stations. I mean, they hold uh, a lot of its, uh, you know, cell phones and uh, wireless supplies and, and things like that, or who knows what else they own corporately. And they don't see it as a calling as much as uh, I think used to be. Uh, and and that's also hurting it. And then, of course, they hire people who then, uh, I think, as they say, they tend to be uh, not as uh, dedicated journalists or investigative types. And every so often, one comes along. You'll notice in the blog, I didn't tend to single out people for criticism because it's not just one person. It's the whole gamut of them. Uh, you know, nobody's shouting at the politicians. Nobody's arguing. There's only one reporter I've seen or heard on the radio or TV uh, recently that I thought, oh, this is like old times. And it's uh, a reporter for Global uh, um, uh, who's doing the investigations on um, uh, the Casino Gate uh, and uh, Sam Cooper. And he's a global national investigative reporter. He's he's terrific. He, I mean, I listen to him. It reminds me like Mike Wallace or something, you know, on CBS. I mean, he's really good. But he's the only one that stands out out of all the ones I've heard on every network. And, uh, uh, it, you know, and that's a pretty sad situation when there's one person who uh, impresses an old reporter like myself. We'll have more with Harvey Oberfeld right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Harvey Oberfeld. Harvey, does the mainstream media tend to create the news to push their own particular agendas? No, I don't. I don't think so. I, I mean, uh, they're they're not that smart these days to do that. You know, it's not like they're motivated by anything. Um, I think they uh, they they are much more malleable than they used to be. I think they're more controlled by government, federally, uh, provincially, and take a look at what's happened in BC on the munis- municipal level. Um, you know, take a look what's happened in BC on the municipal level. When I was a young reporter, we all had a bureau at City Hall. There was everybody, every radio station, the newspapers, the TV. Actually, we had a press room at City Hall that was covered daily and actively, and people operated from out of there. Now, I don't think that happens at all. I think uh, basically City Hall has been given, uh, again, because of cuts in spending, uh, the City Hall has a free hand. It's rarely covered, very rarely covered, and I think we're all paying a very bad price for that. I think the situation at Vancouver City Hall, the situation at the park board, I don't even know if anybody covers the school board meetings anymore. It's all, uh, you know, it's almost like uh, uncontrolled. I mean, uh, unless somebody gets a tip about some particular story, but the the media are not there on, a, you know, really pushing the coverage at, at the municipal level, regional level, um, on a regular daily basis. And I think the politicians are getting away with a lot because of that. So it's not that the media have an agenda. It's that the politicians have an agenda, and nobody's watching until one particular thing comes up, and then they all pay lots of attention to it for about a week, and then they go away again, and you don't see them until another uh, thing comes up that... Uh, you know, tweaks on the public's, uh, 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 gets attention from the public. Uh, but I think we're paying a big price for that. Back in the day when you were working at BC TV, would you have complied if told to push a narrative instead of the truth? You know, it, I, I don't know. I, I, well, I knew no, what I, I would not, I would not, but I, I, it never happened. I must say, uh, I was never, ever told this is the angle we're doing now we had supervisors who would uh who would look at what we did and would sort of direct the uh operations from almost like a command post you know and the two people that really ran the news hour were cameron bell the news director and keith bradbury the assignment editor now they depended on the fact that they had hired senior established reporters away from the sun and the province and uh, and even at BCTV, some of the people that worked there then have, went on to work at U.S. networks and internationally. So these were really good reporters. But they also, you know, they did direct us. They sort of had a focus on what what we're going after today. What you know, and they they collated all the information. But they never ever told me or anybody I knew this is uh, this is what the objective is that we're going to take a particular slant on a story it was this is what we're looking for see if we can find out anything about this because we understand this may have happened on that day you know like uh, that's why we had gracie's finger we had the uh you know the uh letter gate you know and phony letters to the editor were being written we had lots of stuff like that but i never had them say to me you know uh we want to go after this politician or that the only thing i ever heard was at the at the height of our Gracie's finger and Lettergate. I mean, we ended up. I think there were eight or ten people who resigned their jobs with government because of the things we we showed. The only thing I ever heard was that the top management of BCTV uh, said to the mid management, "You just better be right." You know, that was it. That if you're gonna, you know, we'll stick with you because they were getting a lot of pressure. I understood at the top from, you know, friends, you know, of uh, the government and that at the time, uh, you know, to back off. But uh, we were never told to back off. The only thing we were told is you'd better be right. And with all the awards we won and with all the people who ended up resigning uh, and everything, uh, the stuff we revealed, clearly we were right. Uh, but I don't see that kind of reporting anymore, very rarely. 
When flipping through the channels during the evening news, the news stories seem to be pretty much the same, told the same way in all the channels. How does that happen? Well, that's because there's no imagination. Uh, that's one of my chief uh, disappointments. You know, it used to be when when uh, when BCTV was at its prime, and I'm talking about you know you know when it had six hundred and fifty thousand viewers a night. You know that we're talking fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. They had six hundred to six hundred fifty thousand a night, uh, quite often. Now, they, if they get four hundred thousand, they celebrate, and that's despite the population growth. You know, and then, and they're still the top station. You know, CTV is even less, and CBC. I don't even know if it registers anymore on the on the ratings dial. So, uh, it, when we had that many viewers. Uh, People tuned in because you would see things you didn't already know. In fact, if you didn't watch the news hour, you would be out of the loop at work the next day because everybody would be talking about, did you see what they did? Did you see that, you know? And, uh, uh, and, and people would tune in. I mean, they wanted to see it. Now, when I watch the news, uh, well, I'll tell you how I do it. I record CTV. I record BCTV, and then I speed through it. I don't sit there and watch it for the hour. And what I've noticed is over the years, I'm able to speed through it faster and faster. It used to take 40 minutes, then it was 20, now it's about 15. Because so much of what is on there, if you're a news junkie, you've already heard on the radio earlier that day, or if you're listening in your car or listening at home, is very little that's absolutely new. So you look at some of it. Uh, and in that regard, I think CTV is actually, I, I find myself pausing more often at CTV. They do have some more unusual stories at six that I haven't seen or heard elsewhere. But much of it, especially on global now, unfortunately, it's n- nothing new. It's all been stuff that, uh, I mean, rarely is it anything new. It's far too often. It's very cliche. They're all doing the same stories. And I think that's, partially because of what I said earlier. There's not enough staff, there's not enough funding, and they're pushed to do so much for so many uh, different broadcasts and uh, platforms, and also uh, they don't have the people, the seasoned old uh, grizzled journalists doing the work, uh, uh, or professional investigative reporter types uh, that are doing the work. So, they, you, you know, it's all just very mundane. How does the news reporting in the heyday of BC TV compare to the TV news now? No comparison. It's almost embarrassing now, to tell you the truth. Uh, but not, you know, all of them. All of them. I mean, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's just a shame. I mean, uh, uh, and, and they're very highly paid. They're paid higher than we were, I understand, in a lot of cases, of course. But, uh, it's just, uh, you know, they don't have uh, a lot of investigative people uh, other than, as they say, Global has Sam Cooper who does the uh, investigative stuff on the uh, casino gate and all that, and he's terrific. Uh, the rest of them, a lot of them just seem to be treading water. And, you know, they're, 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 they're just giving, you know, reporting the, the stories du jour, uh, very little... Uh, uh, excitement in what they report, very little uh, taking on the politicians, very little uh, digging, very little, you know, the old type of stuff that Harvey and others used to do where you walk in on somebody with the cameras rolling and all that. No, no, we don't do any of that anymore, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, I know some of it's because of the pandemic, but this is a problem that goes far back. This goes back years. And there's nothing more evident that uh, the public have noticed that, as I said, when I was there, uh, uh, BCTV used to regularly get 600,000, 650,000 viewers a night for the news hour, and now they're happy if they get 400,000, and that's despite population growth over the last 15 years. So uh, it it really, uh, you know, the public are noticing, and the public are leaving, uh, and uh, if you speak to the managers at these stations, quite often they'll say, well, it's just, it's fractured, it's much more, there's many more stations, there's many more, uh, you know, uh, sources of news, sources of information on the Internet, but a really good newscast or something or something where they put the uh, time and effort in, uh, people are still tuning in and still watching. So uh, I, I don't buy it. I think there's some of that maybe, but they could do a lot better in what they report and how they report it. And maybe if they put a little heat to the feet of the politicians, 
instead of just regurgitating the message of the day coming out of Victoria or City Hall or uh, the Park Board, uh, you know, raising hell a little bit, uh, maybe the people would come back. Back in the BCTV days, was the objective to get the truth and to call out politicians on their lies and corruption? Well, it was the objective was to tell people what was really going on. I mean, that's what you were. Well, that's what we we thought we were doing. That's what we hoped we were doing. And the fact that uh, uh, you know, I don't think we we got sued when uh, when I was there or anything. I was never sued. I mean, I did a lot of aggressive stuff. Uh, so. Uh, you know, it wasn't to get the politicians, although I will say this, uh, uh, somebody once asked me, you know, you've covered politics for like 30 years, 35 years, whose side are you on? And I always used to say, I'm on the opposition side at the time, whoever's in opposition, because the media in a way is the voice of the opposition, uh, and many, many times I used to have friends among opposition parties uh, who I would do stories for when they would criticize what government was doing and then when their party would get elected and they went into government a lot of them were really upset with me because they felt they felt i turned on them because now i was on the other side opposition going after them and asking the tough questions and that so um you know you're not out deliberately to get them but when you take people and you you know elect them to an office and then give them billions of dollars of taxpayers money or give them the powers to affect how we live our lives you have a duty to ask very very tough questions and to go after them and make sure that when they walk out of the press if they walk out of the press uh, meeting at the press conference and they're happy and they're smiling you haven't done your job and uh, i must say that when i did it uh, a lot of times they didn't like me when i would ask these questions or go after them but uh uh, you know, they respected me, and after they would be out of there, they'd give me a grudging, you know, they knew what I was doing, and they knew what they were doing. So, uh, but you don't see that much anymore. I think they're too chummy. I think reporters are too chummy with politicians these days, and uh, that bothers me, and I think it, uh, it lessens the impact of the reporting, and it shortchanges the listeners, the readers, and the viewers. Perhaps uh, they want to be the next Mike Duffy or Pamela Wallen and get appointed to the Senate. Well, uh, yeah, where's my Senate seat? Where's or, mine? Or my Order of B.C. or my Order of Canada. <laughs> See, I did offend so many people that I don't think any of those would come my way. But you know what? I sleep very well at night knowing that I didn't qualify for any of them. In fact, uh, I didn't even get the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Webster's even though Jack is the one that got me to go to BCTV, and I covered Jack's funeral. He and I were that uh, closely associated professionally. But they ups- I, was ups- I think I upset the people at BCTV with uh, my union activity. And then when I started blogging, criticizing the decline of media. So I think even the people that I used to work with uh, didn't like me or don't like me anymore because I tell it like it is. And uh, you may have noticed in the 60th anniversary tributes they had, you didn't see a picture or a clip of any of Harvey's stories because I don't think I'm very popular with the current management there because I take a stand for journalism and for what I think is right. And uh, sometimes uh, you don't win friends that way. Harvey, I know you were very critical when Shaw, the owners of Global TV uh, here in Vancouver, cut their local cable news in Vancouver, Calgary, and Saskatoon, promising the money saved would go into more local news coverage. Has that happened? Well, I haven't noticed much of you as anybody. Uh, That was the thing. Remember uh, Shaw Cable? I mean, everybody used to laugh about it and make jokes about it, but you'd be surprised how many people did tune in. You'd, they'd watch city council or they, they would, they would, pre, they would, uh, you know, uh, tell, uh, te- televise events that most of us would ignore, even like high school sports or things like that. But, you know, they covered city council. They had people there. You could always watch it. And now, uh, nobody watches it. I mean, you know, they said, well, we're going to give us this big financial break. Take this rock off our backs. And we'll step up our community thing. And I'm sure if you went to their accountants, they could show you on the books, oh, yes, we increased our spending on this and spending that. Uh, uh, they probably re- used it, a lot of it to decrease their debt. Um, but I, I haven't noticed any great improvement. In fact, I think we're sadly uh, paying a very heavy price 
for the lack of community exposure of what's going on at City Hall, what's going on at uh, the Park Board, because Shaw is not there. Shaw Cable is not there anymore. And uh, I think it's sad. I think it was a loss. And I don't think the city has been, or the overall community, and even in the suburbs, has been uh, well rewarded for that. I think they're paying a very heavy price. And I think it hurts. And uh, I blame the CRTC. I think the CRTC is part of the problem for what we see in the media these days. The lack of quality, the lack of, uh, uh, you know, really improvement in what they're doing. And the CBC, CRTC, CRTC has let them get away with it. And uh, I think that's part of the problem. We'll have more with Harvey Oberfeld right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Harvey Oberfeld. Harvey, when did you notice the media turning towards pushing narratives? Well, I don't I, I don't think it's that they decided that they're pushing narratives. I think they just got to the point where the easiest way was to take what's coming out on a platter. You know, the press conference at the police station, instead of going there and being there on scene and pushing past the lines, we just don't have the staff that does a lot of that these days. Uh, the press conferences at the municipal level, at the provincial level, or any community groups, it's just uh, sort of what's handed on a platter. There's very little time, there's very little effort put into uh, digging because they don't have the resources, they don't have the personnel, and I think, frankly, no one's kicking ass at the desks telling them to go out and do it or push it. They just want to get more and more out of them so they can feed the beast, you know, the so many broadcasts a day, internet, doing live hits, doing this, live interviews, putting stuff on the internet. I mean, uh, editing their own stories, you know, that shooting their own stories, all this kind of stuff. So you're doing so much more with so much less. The quality is deteriorated, and I think we're seeing that. Uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not deliberately done to lower the quality. Uh, that's just the product of, uh, of what they've done to do so much more with so much less. Were you ever blackballed in the TV industry? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I've paid a price for some of the strong stands I've taken, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of people, you know, who don't like me, uh, but that doesn't, never, never has bothered me, you know, uh, but, uh, I, I wouldn't think I've ever been blackballed. I don't get invited to a lot of things, uh, and as I, you know, I, I, I didn't get the Lifetime Achievement Award because, uh, even though I'd been in Ottawa, even though I was the first regional affairs reporter that the Vancouver Sun ever had set up the beat, was the first uh, active full-time bureau chief in Ottawa. I think I made quite a presence in Ottawa. I think I made a pretty good uh, presence in Victoria. Uh, and then when I came back here uh, after Ottawa, look at all the awards I won, Canadian Association of Broadcasters, RTNDA, few Websters. I was a uh, finalist in the Governor General's. Uh, award in Ottawa, but uh, for series I did, investigative series, but I never got the Lifetime Achievement Award because I, th- I believe uh, even my own management at BCTV, they uh, they did not like when I felt the wrath of the corporation because I helped start a union. Well, that's, that's not a good career move if you care enough about what you see happening to other people around you that you take a stand. So I think that uh, was held against me. And I paid a very heavy price for that, which I've written about on my blog. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, and then, of course, I started after retiring, I started writing a blog where I criticized the media 
and what's going on in the media. So for some reason, when the uh, Websters came to look at the uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards, uh, they've never uh, they've never bestowed that wonderful thing on me. But other than that, I don't think I. That's the closest I think I could say I've been blackballed, but that's a very small price to pay for keeping your integrity and uh, doing things that the public still, they still stop me on the streets or in stores and thank me for my years. And a lot of them read the blog. Thousands of people read that blog, especially people in government and people in the media, I know because I hear from them. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm having fun and uh, don't regret a thing. Are more and more people searching for credible news sources on the Internet? Um, I think they are. I think people are, just for the instant, you know, uh, the one thing you can do with your with cell phones now and the Internet is when you're out somewhere and you've got a few minutes, you, you can get alerts, you can see things on the Internet right away. Uh, you don't have to, you know, do your work at, uh, all day and then come home at 5 o'clock and, rush to turn on the TV. That is part of the reality that's changed. So there is much more information available. However, I would say this. If you, if people knew that when they came home at 6 o'clock, they were going to see an aggressive angle, a fun angle, an entertaining angle to what they heard about during the day, they would still rush home the way they used to do, thinking, oh, let's go see what Harvey's going to do with this one, or let's go see what Clem Chappell's got, or let's see what John Daly has come up with, or let's go see, you know, any of the reporters at even the other stations, you know, people uh, had their favorites, and they would rush home to see what we were going to do. And with the news hour, the best thing was, quite often you'd see things on the news hour that you didn't already hear on the radio, because we were innovative, we had our own investigative stuff, and uh, and we would do things like uh, that no other station would do. But uh, I don't see that very much uh, these days. Where do you go for your news in this day of fake news? Well, I look at it all. I, I start, uh, you know, I've been retired now for like 14 years officially, although my blog is still so, is pretty widely read. And it keeps me going. I do that to keep alert. That's basically why I do it. There's no revenue. It's just fun, and it keeps me somewhat uh, involved. Uh, but I'm up at 6 in the morning, and I start off with BBC News. And then at 7, I watch Al Jazeera. 8 o'clock, I'll go to CBC or CTV National News. And uh, then I'll listen to the radio while I'm doing other things. I mean, you know. And during the day, I'm always checking it just... You know, I, the TV's on, the radio's on. Or if I'm out in the car, the car is on. I just, uh, I just love to know what's going on in the world, uh, not just in BC, but you know, elsewhere. And uh, I'm just fascinated by it. I've always been intrigued by it and interested, and uh, uh, that has never ended. Even though I'm retired, you know, and I'm still up by six o'clock in the morning following the news and looking for then things get me going. And then I think I better write a blog about it, you know, before I burst, you know, and that's what I do. The Indian News from India is reporting on alleged misdeeds by Prime Minister Trudeau. Why isn't the mainstream media in Canada reporting on that? Well, I've seen that. I know there's, I mean, I'm not a specialist in India, but what's going on is, uh, uh, you know, there's some farmers in India that have a problem and they've been demonstrating They've been blockading. They've been, you know, this uh, they, taking strong actions. And what's happened is some of the East Indian community here, notably Sikhs from the Punjab and that area, have been supporting them. They've had all kinds of demonstrations. And then Trudeau, uh, rightly or wrongly, made a comment, you know, ever the politician that he is, uh, in support and expressing concern for the situation of the farmers in the Punjab or whatever, what's going on. Because he could see the demonstrations taking place in Toronto and in Vancouver, and I guess he figured, oh, I better <laughs> show my support, you know. Never know when I might need it in an election. Um, and he made some uh, remarks, which I'm not sure. Sometimes I think, you know, we shouldn't really have our politicians commenting what's going on in the internal affairs of other countries. But on the other hand, when I see abuses taking place in so many other countries, I shout, why aren't our politicians speaking up? So I don't really object the fact that he uh, spoke up, although, you know, uh, this is probably not his priority at the time. But what happened is they got upset in India. Modi 
you know, Prime Minister Modi, who hasn't had a press conference, I think he has like one in his whole career, he doesn't have press conferences. He refuses to have press conferences or take questions. What he does is he meets with the bosses of the media and he tells them, he goes up one side of them and down the other, from what I've heard, and they're very meek and they don't want to have any government actions taken against them corporately, so they follow along. And uh, very rare is the media that stands up to Modi in India. So what's happened is because Modi was upset with Trudeau, uh, all of a sudden the, some of the Indian media over in India have started criticizing Trudeau. So uh, I don't. I, I watched one of the broadcasts, uh, you know, the newscasts. Uh, it was it was just horrible. It was not it would not meet my news standard, read by some uh, host who seemed totally bored with what she was reading off the teleprompter. And uh, uh, so I don't put much faith in it. I mean, Trudeau, maybe it's a gaffe that he spoke out about what's going on in another nation. But uh, if he didn't speak out, I probably wouldn't have commented on this one, but if he stopped speaking out about what's going on in Saudi Arabia or China or Russia or, uh, you know, places like that or Belarus, I'd be down his throat. So, uh, you know, you can't win in that case. So I don't. I think Trudeau's got enough other things we could criticize him for, uh, and that's not one that I would uh, get really upset about. Change.org has a new petition to remove Trudeau from office. Is this a sign that people are doing the job that the mainstream media should be doing? No, no. I, change.org, I mean, you anybody could put anything on there and ask, you know, and that's part of democracy. Uh, good luck to them. Uh, the, the people will decide in the election. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'll tell you something, the next election, how Trudeau does, I wrote a blog on this, it will all depend on how we do with the rollout of the vaccine. Because if the rollout of the vaccine is uh, goes very poorly, and if there's spoiled doses and people aren't getting it, or they delay the second doses and people get sick because they didn't get the second doses on time, then he will pay a heavy price, and so will some of the premiers. But if it all goes well, if it's all swimmingly well, and, uh, you know, everybody's getting injected and the rate goes down uh, and the economy is building up, uh, he'll benefit from that. So I would think if I were Trudeau, I'd really be worried more about uh, the rollout of the vaccine more than what some uh, citizens group is doing on some petition site. The coronavirus scare has two sides to it. One says it's a deadly pandemic. The other says it's a hoax. Questions need to be asked on the push for vaccines for a disease that's 99.9% curable and on the significant health issues that can be caused by wearing masks. Is As the COVID numbers grow, it seems the numbers for influenza and pneumonia have disappeared. I don't, you know, I don't buy into that. I I think there's... uh... Uh, you take a look at the annual death rate in the country when the figures come out. Uh, they've already come out in Russia. The annual rate of, I forget what the numbers were, but the, the last year, the number of total dead from various causes across Russia was substantially higher than any previous year. So whatever reason you give, it's clear something's up. And I don't buy this that there's two sides to this story. No, there is a pandemic. People are dying. Uh, we have to get on top of it. There are some people who don't buy it, but it's not its not an either-or. I think uh, those people are uh, a minority. Uh, they don't represent the majority of people or the majority of thought, and they have the right to that thought, but uh, I don't, uh, I don't, frankly, I can't wait to get the shot. We've done interviews on the subject of COVID with John Rappaport from nomorefakenews.com, David Ike from davidike.com, and BC doctor Stephen Malthouse to figure out what's going on. Do you think the mainstream media is pushing the government narrative instead of doing an honest deep dive into the story? No. I think the media are pushing the scientific, uh, true scientific thing. It's like climate change. You know, I mean, you have a choice. You can either listen to 90% of the scientists or you can find uh, 2% and highlight those 2%. Uh, I'll stick with the 90% on climate change, and I'll stick with the 90% on pandemic, and the 90% on the spread of the virus, and the 90% of people who are analyzing the, the figures that are coming in. Uh, there will always be people, you know, there's some people who say that uh, Trump won the election, by the way. 
uh, and they're demonstrating right now and rioting and all that. There's some people who say, you know, uh, all kinds of things. I'll stick with the 90% on this one and, and many of the other topics. Uh, and I won't, it's not that I'm pushing them, I just go with the science rather than uh, the small, small minority who, uh, you know, say the earth is flat. Millions of people in the U.S. are alleging voter fraud there. People in Canada are now starting to ask questions about how fair and valid our elections have been. Would today's mainstream media investigate that the way the old BCTV news staff would? Well, I think if, uh, you know, we investigated uh, Gracie's Finger and we investigated Lettergate, you know, if there's some evidence, there's an interesting word we don't seem to see in the news quite often these days that actually being shown, evidence. If there was evidence, but if somebody had come forward in the BCDV heyday and said, you know, people are writing phony letters to the editor, uh, you know, pretending to be uh, citizens when they're really government officials, and if we said, well, show us one or two, which one are you referring to? And they just said, well, no, I just heard it. Well, we wouldn't have reported that. You need evidence. So when there's evidence, then, you know, then that's significant, uh, then it becomes important. But people just saying things, saying they heard this, they heard this and that, you know, there might be, that's not reportable. I, I don't think that's reportable. Not in a credible news source. Uh, and, uh, I, I think we're, the media is still generally pretty good about asking for evidence when something is reported. And then, uh, and, and I'll tell you, you know, talk about elections. I'm from Quebec. I mean, elections have always had dead people voting. I mean, it's almost a proud old tradition in Quebec, you know. Uh, and I think everywhere else. The question is how many. And if you're going to have an election of uh, 350 million people, and you can prove that, you know, maybe 150 are dead people or, or let's say 1,050 dead people voted. It's the question of whether, how did that affect the uh, overall election? It wasn't enough to change it. Uh, and that's where these things always fall down. But I, do, I have no doubt that in elections, there's always somebody who uh, ends up voting, uh, you know, the shenanigans happen, right? And, uh, but it, the thing is, is, is it serious enough to materially affect the outcome or even blemish the outcome and that's where you need evidence and I don't see quite often I hear people saying things in Canada in the states but when you say where's the evidence show me the evidence uh, they don't really come up with anything else if you control the media and you control the elections can you control the people uh, well, if you control the media I don't know who who really controls the media? It's so you know, it's all these companies that own them. But uh, I don't. I, I really don't think if you you can control the people. The people are smart. You know, the people uh, take a look at the media these days. The, the media are not giving them what they used to in quality. So the viewers have gone away. The listeners go away. I mean, the readers go away. Look at you know. So you can't control them. Uh, they just walk away from you. So uh, they hit you financially and really in the end it's a business isn't it we're hearing the prime minister might have flown south for the holidays just like a number of other politicians while everybody else in canada was locked down why isn't the mainstream media investigating that i haven't heard anything about that don't know anything about it if he's gone if he did go i think i don't know a reporter who wouldn't want to report that with great glee uh, you know so I haven't heard anything about that, and I'm sure people have looked in to where he was and what he did. I hey. hope he didn't go to the Agricons private island. <laughs> <laughs> BCTV recently turned 60. Your thoughts on BCTV looking back? Well, I wrote a blog about that. Uh, they did a whole month-long series. It was a terrific, wonderful tribute to BC's history. It was a dismal tribute to BCTV. Uh, you'll notice, I mean, they kept pointing out except for one or two stories where they showed some of the management types and top people at top you know the anchors and that but they really pretty well ignored the reporters the people who really built the station the soldiers out there on the battlefield you know the clem chapel uh john gibbs uh dale hicks john daly arden ostrander uh some of the old pioneers of bctv 
uh, and and they didn't show the clips of the stories that made us famous. Maybe they didn't want to show up what they're doing these days. Uh, but it was mostly a it was a tribute to BC events that happened during those years, and I thought that was very good. Uh, and of course, you, you may have noticed they left me out of it completely because even though I won lots of awards for them, and I kind of think I helped their ratings. They didn't like me at the end years. They treated me kind of miserably, and uh, they were not happy with my union uh, uh, efforts to support the union when the workers decided to unionize. And then when I retired, I started uh, writing a blog where I've been highly critical of not just them, but just the media generally, the decline in quality. So for some reason, they didn't want to include, or they didn't include anything of me in the tribute at all. But that's okay. They didn't include anything of the other pioneers either, other than a few who made it into management or were rankers. So I'm in good company by being left out. Is it laziness that uh, CKNW now at 6 o'clock runs the global TV news on the radio rather than highlighting the news that their reporters have gathered during the day? Well, I think a lot of the news that they have gathered during the day is on the BC TV news hour at 6 o'clock. I mean, that's what happens when you have corporate ownership that crosses uh, from radio to TV. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's consolidation of effort, and you're saving money. You're trying to get the greater exposure for your show, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know. it. I, I sometimes, if I'm in the car... I listen to it because I want to hear what's going on, uh, but um, uh, the shows, it's not much different. I mean, basically, what I see quite often on the news hour, I've heard on NW during the day anyway, so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it, I don't see much difference in it. It doesn't, it doesn't impress me, but it's the way it is these days, and, uh, you know, my blog is called Keeping It Real, and that's the way the media are these days, too. That's just the reality we now face. Harvey, where can people find out more about Keeping It Real? Well, it's just on there. You just Google Harvey Oberfeld, and it comes up. It's called Keeping It Real. It's harveyoberfeld.ca. No ads. Uh, you know, you can follow me on Twitter, and you get first alerts to all new topics. And unlike a lot of the other blogs, you can comment, and you can rant and rave and disagree with me. And we get into some pretty good discussions. I've had people in politics write in. I've had people in the media write in. And uh, I, you know, I'm just having fun and uh, giving people a forum uh, where they can rant and rave. And uh, hopefully uh, I do know it's well read by politicians and people in the media and now in the corporate world. And I know that because I'm starting to get press releases and that inviting me to press conferences and that. So people are paying attention. Uh, perhaps we need the Harvey Oberfeld challenge to reporters to ask these particular tough questions. Well, any tough questions I'd be happy with. I just, the only thing I'd say to anybody in the media listening, if you go to a press conference and the politicians leave still laughing and smiling with you, you have not done your job. Harvey, thank you so much for chatting with us. You're welcome. My guest has been award-winning, retired, but still issue-engaged television reporter Harvey Oberfeld. You can read his blog, Keeping It Real, at harveyoberfeld.ca. If you have any questions for our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at Talk Digital Net. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.